All right. Welcome, everybody. Another session of SF Dog. Thank you for coming. Uh, just out of curiosity, who's here for the first time? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Welcome. We always welcome new members. Uh, my name is Cesar Escalante. I'm the coordinator of this group. And uh, if you want to follow us about our activities, just go to our website, sfdug.org, and there is a link where you can subscribe for announcements of forthcoming uh, presenters. Um, also, if you have uh, work that you want to present to the group, you're welcome to just drop us an email. The email is on the screen, and uh, we're happy to feature you. Um, the next open, uh, actually, we're booked until December already. So, <laughs> the ne the ne yes. So it will be until next year. But anyone is open to present, uh, right? Um, I want to also welcome our group of students from Academy of Art University. Um, these are my students. I brought them to hear them. And um, uh, let's start with a few announcements. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Randy Dutch. He is flying. He flew from Chicago this morning, so I appreciate his willingness to share. Uh, his knowledge. Uh, uh, I'll do a formal introduction in a bit. Um, there are a few computational design activities coming up. Uh, there is an online C scripting and plugin development for Grasshopper class. It's free by the Institute of Computational Design in Stuttgart, uh, April 26, 27, and 28. All you need to do is download the data set and it's going to be very early in the morning. <laughs> so if you want to be part of that, uh, be willing to get up at 3 in the morning. But it's free, and it's Long Nguyen. It's a great uh, researcher. Uh, he, um, he will be leading uh, the discussion and the demonstration online. Uh, sign up if you're interested to how to create uh, custom plugins. Um, Another international event, this is in Technical University of Munich. It's a summer school uh, workshop, Computer Resilience. Uh, this is led by Theodore Galeano. And uh, it's also a full day workshop. So if you're interested, uh, the, you want to spend your, your a week in Germany, there's the link. Uh, this is another one, Shape to Fabrication, in uh, Stratford, London. It's coming up 24 and the 25th. There are great speakers in this. Uh, in this uh, I, I don't think they're going to be uh, broadcasted online. But uh, after looking at the presenters, uh, it's one of the things that I would like to go. I just don't have the time and the money. But it's, uh, it's there if you want to go. A free uh, webinar online hosted by uh, Thank God is Computational. This is Machine Learn Design Space on Wednesday, May 16 at 7 in the morning. Uh, sign up for free. It's, uh, uh, it's going to be a early, early morning, not too bad. Uh, if you don't know Thank God Computational, it's, uh, uh, it's led by Vin Vinish in uh, India, and he set up uh, he has started setting up a series of great design technology talks once a month. And so uh, this one it's, uh, seems very, very interesting as well. Uh, let's see what else. Paul Wintour is having a Dynamo workshop in Australia. Uh, and uh, it's coming up in May as well. Another venue to learn uh, Dynamo from scratch. Uh, I believe it's a couple of days. Uh, information is also online. And uh, in the Netherlands, the SIM out 2018 is coming up in June. I look at the agenda for this for these workshops, and I I was just really uh, 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 the quality of the workshop is really great. So uh, check it out. It's a uh, there's a lot of computational design, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. I think those are the topics uh, for these uh, workshops. Oh, and uh, in uh, uh, 
In Boston, the Beyond AEC Hackathon has just been announced. It's going to be Friday, uh, July the 20th, and Saturday, July 21. It now has a symposium component. This is the second edition. Uh, Kyle Martin, a good friend of mine, is uh, the facilitator. And uh, go to beyondaec.tech if you want to register for it. Teams are starting to get formed. Um, okay, next meetings. Tartan Tomasetti is going to be our May presenter, May 23rd. And Samuel Barcenas from Costa Beam in Mexico City is flying just to present as well. So um, that's on June 16. Again, thank you for all our sponsors, uh, IDA for the food, uh, Gensler for the webinar, uh, technology, and AIA for the great space. And I am pleased now to introduce uh, Randy Dutch, director of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, speaking about the making, breaking, and fixing of computational design super user. Uh, those who are online, uh, the questions, feel free to write them on the chat panel. And uh, we're going to reserve a space at the end of the presentation to address uh, your comments and questions. Uh, thank you. So let's switch. Great. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, as Cesar mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Studies at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Um, I do teach online classes. I do teach classes face-to-face. -face. I've been teaching uh, at the university level for 17 years. I've never taught uh, a session that's both live face-to-face -face, uh, and synchronously uh, online at the same time, so this is a real treat. Thank you for coming out. Uh, for those of you that are uh, watching at home, uh, thanks for joining us. Hope to make this uh, worthwhile for you. Um, I will not be sharing any uh, tips or tricks about tools in this talk. As you can see from the title, this is a very high-level talk uh, looking into the future, um, something that's frowned upon in academia, trying to uh, look in the crystal ball and figure out what's going to happen in the future. Um, uh, but I do uh, practice-based research where I talk to practitioners um, and uh, am able, in talking with them, asking them very pointed questions, uh, getting into fairly deep conversations, get an idea as to where things are headed. And where they're headed is we have a tech transformation going on. And very few of us really understand what the implications are for practice, um, what the implications are for our careers, for our uh, livelihoods, and um, a good part of my research has resulted in writing, in books in particular. It's interesting that computation is a very uh, um, uh, fascinating and targeted technology, and books aren't. Books are antiquated. Uh, there's not a lot of people who uh, read books these days. I still think it's a very important way to gather information, to capture it, and to disseminate it. Uh, so we have a snapshot, in this case, uh, these four publications over the last six years, um, because we have uh, the transformation technology happening in a, a very fast clip. So it's like taking a snapshot over time. All of this has led to my next book. It doesn't come out until next year, but I'll share with you today some insights that I've gathered through conversations with computational designers or design technologists across the world in the recent last uh, six to eight months. And I will be capturing this, um, some of the ideas, some of the insights I'm sharing with you and others in this book when it comes out. This book is very different from the ones that I've written in the past in that it's very personal and it's also more of a narrative than uh, something like a textbook. So I'd like to, you know, normally when you give a talk on a topic like this, you, you uh, give a lot of background, a lot of history, and you lead up to the big idea. I'm going to share with you the big idea right at the beginning. And if it's not that big for you, it gives you an opportunity to walk out. <laughs> and Cesar's like, no, don't leave. Um, but I think um, it's important that we think about what it takes to be a super user in the computational world um, in four basic ways. And the four ways all start with C's. 
So it makes it easier for you to understand. And the, the most important thing is that a computational designer has the wherewithal to recognize a tool when uh, one is presented to them, when they come across one, when um, they recognize that they need to uh, create a plug-in or add-on of their own to plug in or add-on to another tool. And that's a very uh, important skill to have. But the foremost important mindsets as opposed to skill sets, the first one's curiosity. And this one, as, a, um, as an educator for 17 years, this is the only one that you cannot teach. I cannot teach this at all. And everyone in this room has curiosity. It's the reason you're here after a long day of work. It's the reason that um, you're interested in this topic enough to belong to an organization like uh, SF Doug. Um, and I think uh, curiosity is, is uh, exemplified and comes across and manifested in a number of different ways, one of which is a passion for learning. Yeah, the fact that you are interested in learning about these different tools, learning how to use them better, apply them better, or when you come across something that's repeatable, you, ought, you find a way to automate it, for example, using computational tools. So curiosity comes first, um, and that's a curiosity about the tools. This next one is confidence. It's the confidence to take software home. Maybe it's a new tool that was brought into the office, and either you volunteer or secretly take, take it home and start messing with it. You feel comfortable making mistakes. You know that's not going to be the end of the world. Um, I can't explain where the confidence comes from. In a previous book on data-driven design, the one commonality after talking to 48 uh, data-driven designers or data scientists in our field in the AEC industry was at the age of eight, men and women alike in the field, engineers, designers, contractors who leverage data, all had a parent or an uncle or aunt who gave them a computer that they took apart. That was the one thing they all had in common. I haven't found that commonality yet other than curiosity and confidence um, in the two other C's in all of the super users that uh, I've, I've talked to so far. The next one is capacity, and this is a really important one. The fact that, let's say millennials. Millennials, if you don't mind um, being described as a uh, demographic, if you um, are already practicing right now and you haven't been practicing for 20 years, you're, uh, you're uh, chances are you're a millennial. Millennials love, I know this because it's my grad students, it's my grad students that I've had um, for several years now who've gone on to become emerging professionals out in the field, many of whom are working in San Francisco now. They should be here today. Um, they, uh, they want work-life balance, and they often uh, express the fact that they don't have capacity from a time standpoint, from an energy standpoint, which is as important as time, the capacity to learn something new. Um, so my best guess for all of you who are in this room and those that have uh, tuned in via the webinar is that you make the space. You find a way, learning is important to you, uh, and you make the space, you have the capacity to always learn more, and that's a really important thing. The last C is, um, is what Einstein called combinatory creativity. Here I'm calling it creativity to combine tools. It's the subject of my last book. Convergence, the redesign of design, and this is something that I don't think we ever really overtly talk about. I'm not going to dwell on it today. I'm not looking to push books, but I think it's a really important thing, and one of my amazing takeaways from working on the research for the book Convergence was the fact that nobody sat down saying, I think today I'm going to combine two tools, or I'm going to take these three different things that we have in the office or that I'm aware of, and put them together in a way that's never been put together before and come up with something new. You're just creative. You're all just very creative, and you do it. You, you have a problem you need to solve. There's a pain point where you want to alleviate the pain, and you do it by means of software or a technology intervention as opposed to aspirin or other medical means. And the uh, combinatory creativity um, approach to things is a fantastic way to go about doing that. So these are, these are all much more important. These are more mindsets than skill sets. These, to me, are much more important than being a whiz at using Grasshopper or Dynamo or any of the related uh, plugins or add-ons. It's, it's 
this uh, this is what the DNA that's uh, that I think connects all super users in this field. And I think this is important. So as the next generation of practitioners, and that includes all of you here uh, tuning in, um, with next generation solutions or technology, what role do you want to play in in moving forward in our field? And what role? Asking the same question in a slightly different way, what role will design technology super users play in shaping the AC industry? So one is uh, one that should be familiar to many of you, and it differentiates my undergrad students currently, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, from the grad students and those that have graduated recently. They're the Gen Zs. The Gen Zs are not interested in plugging themselves into, as a generation, into a cubicle, into a specific position. They don't aspire to be engineers or architects or contractors. They basically want to own the entire pipeline, and not in an entitled way. They want to um, be part of the whole thing. So they realize that they're going to enter into the field. They uh, recognize that for five or eight years they're going to work for somebody else, but they're very entrepreneurial, and they want to connect all the dots. They want to uh, find uh, properties and acquire them, um, whether through their own means or using other people's uh, you know, money. Um, they want to design the projects. They want to uh, go direct to fabrication, leveraging many of the tools that you're already using. And then they want to uh, manage the property. And there's many companies, of course, that are doing this. Uh, I'll, I'll allude to them briefly. Um, in previous uh, research, I talked about the uh, algorithms of everything. Um, here I'm talking about the firms of everything. Katera, we work shop architects. Um, there's probably several others that are not included in this list. And these are the firms that uh, don't have, they don't see themselves as having limits. These are organizations that don't put blinders on and everything that they do um, addresses from the beginning to the end of the process, including in many cases the management of the properties themselves. And the Gen Zs, who are on the, t uh, you know, they're, they're just seniors now. That's the, but they're going to be, you know, first-year grad students, so they're going to go work between undergrad and grad um, school. And um, that's the generation that's sort of on the tail. And the next five to eight years is going to be really interesting, I think, in our field, because this is what they um, want to focus on, more than plugging into a very straightforward um, design firm or boutique firm. The other thing, and this is something that's floated around Twitter for a long time, I spend way too much time on Twitter, this idea that every company is a tech company or every company is a software company, or at least needs to be. And, and I think this is a really important point to make. This is something that's uh, obviously a truism in San Francisco. I don't even need to say this out loud here um, because every company is a tech company here. Um, but there's many parts of the country where this is not a given. It's not this uh, overt or obvious thing to say. Uh, it's actually very threatening for many companies, and many companies in the Midwest in particular, but also on the East Coast, um, in many of the southern states as well, where this is not a foregone conclusion. And this is something I'm going to come back to um, a little further in this talk, this idea where companies, um, more traditional companies, uh, conventional companies don't see themselves in the tech world. They see if they uh, interface with technology in any way, it's a couple of people sitting in the corner of the office who consult on our projects, perhaps, um, something along those lines. And that's something we're going to be moving away from in the very near future. Because of what I just described, we do have this have and have not situation in both academia and also in practice. And you guys are the haves, so this is, this is all good news. Uh, if you're tuning in in the webinar, if you're watching this as a video on YouTube, if you're um, here in this room right now, you are the haves, um, which is great. But there are many, many have-nots, and, and we're living in a populist age, and I think it's incredibly important that we get others on board. So I do share with my students there's this sort of 80-20 um, rule where um, – there's always the 20% exceptions that we're going to have. We're all, we will always need boutique design firms. So those will always be around. People will always need firms that will do, um, uh, you know, 10% of all firms will do master bedroom suite expansions or breakfast nook expansions, things like that in residential design. Um, but they'll make up about 20% of the practices. The other 80% 
have to get on board one way or another. And so one of the opportunities you have is not just advocating on behalf of the tools that you're leveraging currently in your own careers, but finding ways to be more vocal and advocate for the computational tools beyond you know, this room. Find ways to get others on board and recognize the value of it. And that includes the leaders of the organizations um, where you're currently employed. Or if you're a leader yourself, to find a way to bring others up um, and have them be recognized as well. So this is from William Gibson's uh, famous quote, the future is, is here already, it's just not evenly distributed, and that's something we need to change. So as an educator, uh, the first third of the talk is really on the making of computational design super users. This is the quote that sort of advertised the talk, and it, it is true that you're leveraging um, tools, visual programming tools like Dynamo or um, in some cases Grasshopper in other related uh, programming tools as well, Human UI, uh, which even makes it more easy um, to leverage. Um, but the key thing is, is that um, you guys didn't take computers apart when you were eight years old. But the one commonality is, is that you started off, more, more than likely you started off actually using a tool. And um, for some of the computational users that I've interviewed um, for my research, they just lucked out in high school. They uh, started uh, messing with some tools. They had a uh, teacher, an instructor, or turn them on to it, um, and uh, it lit a fire, and they continue on with it as well. And they started getting interested in automating things. This is very hard to read, but basically this is from uh, Design Intelligence very recently in their education uh, quarterly. And what this talks to is this idea that there's a have and have is not situation in academia as well. And it's pretty important because 50% of all schools are focusing in increasing the focus on teaching these tools, and 50% aren't. They're either staying the same that they always have, whether it's teaching CAD or BIM or uh, more of the computational tools, or, or, or uh, AI or virtual reality or AR, um, or they're diminishing it. And I actually belong to the 50% that diminishes it. And it's not um, because of me. I'm fighting it uh, every single day tooth and nail. Um, it's just the history of the University of Illinois, School of Architecture. Um, they don't think it's uh, really necessary. If you're going to learn these tools, their attitude, like the other 50% um, who aren't on board, um, that's something you go, you'll just pick up in practice. You don't really need to learn it in school. And it is this endless catch-22, because without understanding these tools frequently, when you go to a career expo or you go to an interview, and just after shaking the hand of the prospective employer and saying your name, they say, so do you know Revit? Um, that's uh, frequently the very first thing out of their mouths. And um, if you haven't learned it in school, how will you ever have that first internship and uh, get a job after school as well. So I do teach these tools. I teach 23 different tools, but I do it by calling my classes things like anatomy of buildings or the construction of buildings um, um, or seminars with uh, uh, euphemistic uh, names so none of the administrators will know that I'm teaching uh, technology. Um, but this way, the students at least are getting exposed to it. The students seem to know. Nobody drops out after the first day. Once the word of mouth gets around that you can actually learn this stuff in this class, it's great. But we have to teach it in darkened classrooms. Um, uh, the students uh, teach this stuff to each other. They uh, meet in the basements late at night. Um, they don't get recognized. They don't get paid. They don't get attaboys or attagirls for doing this. Um, but many of the students want, they're just like you, they're curious, they're passionate, they're confident, they want to take this on. And um, while they do have uh, lynda.com freely available to them, and there's many other ways like through YouTube, um, other tutorials, um, obviously the, uh, the great um, uh, lectures that come out of, um, and talks and presentations come out of this uh, group as well. They have that available to them, but there's something about doing this in person and learning from a fellow student that really seems to work. So we do do this. The other thing is, is that when you actually ask practitioners, let's say at um, industry events, 
to say what are the tools that everyone's using, there is no real consensus in terms of what are the tools that are taking off. They're all generally between 20 and 30 percent. Um, and these are sometimes done in social media as polls. Sometimes they're done, like in this case, at Autodesk University um, just a few months back. You can see just by looking at the gumballs that you drop into these tubes, um, there's not much of a difference um, between generative design and AI, machine learning, virtual reality, and robotics. They're all roughly, they're not exactly the same, but there's not one that's sort of standing out. And that um, is an opportunity, which is great, because if one of these technologies was catching on um, like wildfire right now, uh, everybody would get on board. Um, so in a way, this gives an opportunity for others outside this venue to uh, catch on. So I think that's a, good, that's a good thing in a way. But it's also complicated because these innovative tools um, um, are innovative still. And uh, I was at an event in Chicago at Gensler last week where the creative director, Brian Vitale, was saying to uh, everyone and all the students who had shown up. These are admitted students for U of I. It was held at their office. And he said, when you graduate in a couple years from school, you're going to have at your workstation a headset. And it's just going to be part of the, uh, the tools that you use. And while that isn't that remarkable uh, for some of you, but for the uh, other 80% that aren't on board yet, that's pretty remarkable. It's remarkable that it's not this expensive headset and the firm owns three of them. It's the fact that there's 300 people in the office and there's 300 headsets and there's one at your desk along with your laptop and everything else. So I always tell my students um, before I'm going to shock them about anything, and the only thing worth having a trigger warning about these days in school is technology. Um, I don't want to uh, make them too fearful about what, what is on the horizon. Um, but this is basically what's on the horizon, and it, it involves hockey sticks, as I'll show you in a moment. The CBA, as opposed to ABC, represents uh, CAD, BIM, and AI. And since we are right here, you know, I'm coming from the Midwest. We have cornfields. Um, you guys have waves. Um, so this is the third and perhaps even the final wave, uh, the wave of AI, uh, coming uh, right on the coattails of BIM. Um, and just based on these uh, little doodles, uh, CAD took 15 to 20 years to take off. BIM, in less than half that time, uh, got up to 75% or 80% of contractors and architects and engineers using it. And AI, um, it's been around, obviously, for a long time. There was an AI winter where not much really happened. It seemed to go away for a while. Uh, and here's that hockey stick where... Um, it's just the, the only question that's left is where are we on this hockey stick? And I place this approximately right here. Um, we are right at the part where things are really going to get interesting, um, which is great. You know, there's enough time for students to graduate in the next couple of years. Um, and this is something that many of you are already leveraging um, AI and machine learning in the tools that you use. So this won't be a surprise um, for those who are here. But again, um, I'm addressing this talk at a high level to all 100% of our industry. And I'm here to tell you that this is like a wildfire, another, uh, like waves, another uh, familiar image in this part of the country. Um, and AI is like that fire that's on the horizon. And towards the end of this talk, I'll share um, 12 recommendations with you that um, I feel serve as a fire truck that can put out the fire of AI, or at least keep it from taking over. Um, but before we get there, I also want to say that um, uh, the advent of AI and machine learning is here. Uh, there's also, because of that, one way to react is to reinvent ourselves, and that's the making, breaking, and fixing of computational designers. It's this opportunity both in school and in firms to, uh, and in organizations like this to start addressing what should we be doing now so five years, eight years, ten years from now, we're all on board in a way where um, we're much more effective and we're well situated in place to be able to uh, address the work that's um, on the horizon. So making really had to do with education. The breaking is a different kind of education. It's more like continuing education. It's the um, realization that 
we there are all, all of these other forces that are going on behind the scenes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Just go through this very quickly. This is an image from uh, my convergence book, and this is literally just looking at the forces that we are all dealing with all the time. Uh, interoperability, accessibility. Accessibility is a fancy way of saying ease of use. So the fact that uh, Grasshopper was made in Dynamo because it's visual programming is easier than programming without the visual component, but then why then do we need a plugin like Human UI that makes it even easier? Why? Because we need for these tools to be accessible for everybody. Um, and this goes with all the other forces. Again, I'm not going to, we could probably talk about this for 40 minutes, but the bottom three on the right, impatience, uh, simultaneity, and feedback, I think, are particularly important ones, and they're ones that are related to the demographic of millennials in particular. Um, I think impatience is one that comes up again and again. In my generation, the reason it took, um, you know, 20 years or 15 years for CAD to get, you know, to get uh, saturated into our industry was uh, there was no rush. We weren't impatient with things. We, you know, kind of plugged along. Um, Today, it's an entirely different story. If you can't get an answer right away to something, you'll invent a tool yourself. Um, so here, I'm just blowing up the images, looking at how they all come together, these forces, and converge. And they even, you know, I don't want to make too big of a point of this, but even these forces start to overlap and converge together as well. The important takeaway here is that as a computational designer, you need to step back, whether it's at a talk like this, talking amongst yourselves, um, talking over beers or coffee, um, trying to understand what is really behind what you're doing. You're not just using these tools because you're good at using them or because it's a way to differentiate yourself in the industry from people who are project managers, project architects, and project designers. There's something else going on, which are these forces that, um, that uh, ought to compel you to use the tools that you're you're using. A whole other framework that I use when I'm working with my students is I let them know that we're going to be talking about buildings as buildings, especially in a class like Design Studio. That's a class where you're designing a building and all it is is a building. Yeah, if it's a comprehensive design studio, it may have MEP components, it may have ADA components and so on, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's a building. But building, but architects don't produce buildings. Uh, architects really produce documents. And so I also teach many classes, a uh, um, sequence of construction courses, where I let the students know that really we're not talking about buildings in this class. Behind the scenes, we're really talking about documentation of buildings, or the documentation design intent. So that carries through. How can that happen with computational tools, for example? How can the design intent that comes from either the lead designer and or the owner carry through, through these tools and not be transformed by the tools? How can the tools that we use, the technology that we use, support the design all the way through construction and beyond um, as opposed to water it down or morph it or transform it? And then lastly, of course, anyone who's worked in um, any of the building information tools, Vectorworks, MicroStation, ARCHICAD, Revit, or any of the other flavors, um, is that um, I let the students know that, it, that what they look, what the building, they're paying 40, 50,000 a year to go to school, and they need to show their parents that they're designing buildings that look like buildings so they can get on the, pinned up on their refrigerators, but really they're spreadsheets. What they're actually working on are databases, and it's that data that's incredibly important. And once they get that and understand it, they run with that. It's just very natural for them. This is not some unusual Rubicon where uh, you talk about it and they don't get it. They completely understand when the dialog boxes pop up as they start working on a Revit model, they uh, completely understand that they're plugging in data and there's a hundred different ways they can slice the building, both in terms of plans and sections and elevation and so on. But there's other ways they can slice it in terms of data, and that's something that's really valuable for them. Um, what this leads to is different ways of defining design. And so this talk is also isn't about this, but I think this is a very important thing to understand as well, that design will always be 
sketching in your moleskin. It will always be taking tracing paper and designing. It will always be computational designers working side by side with designers. But if you think about it, computational designers have the word design in their title, and design technologists have the word designers. But many design technologists and computational designers have no real strong interest in designing buildings or spaces or anything else. It's just, uh, um, it just got that name. Um, and so while that may, design may not be the aspiration, it is the opportunity in many different ways as we move forward. Data-driven design, generative design, predictive design. The other thing is, is that the design that we do is being outsourced 20 years ago. That might have been, meant that it was to another country um, or to different people to do on our behalf. But the software you're using can be perceived as a way of outsourcing the design work. This is a, a continuum. It's a very familiar one where on one side, one extreme is where everything is automated. Everything's computational. Everything's done through computers and machines, and people aren't really involved, other than perhaps setting the criteria or the constraints. The other extreme, it's only people. You don't have to use technology at all. And we're, I'm speaking today in San Francisco, and this far right side of this diagram where everyone designs, designing everything, will be familiar to one or two people in this room as participatory design. Charles Moore and uh, Michael Piatak and others um, it's uh, where you bring people together as a group. Sometimes we refer to it as crowdsource design. Um, so you have generative design where we plug in all the constraints. You put in the building code and so on. Um, and the other extreme is crowdsource design where you get all the people to vote on it. But if you think about crowdsource design is another form of generative design. It's just not one where the computer is generating the design. It's where all the votes of the people generate design. But there's something called the point, the, the five point. So if, if one extreme is zero and the other one is 10, at the five mark is really the sweet spot. And that's the one where we're going to be moving forward um, starting real soon in our industry. It's this combination of feeling comfortable working with um, pure design and working with people and working um, with moleskins and tracing paper and uh, chipboard models. And the other one where we're just completely couple, uh, comfortable working um, in an auto, uh, automated way. And um, here I'm just referring to it as being an augmented architect. It's a fancy way of saying you're a chess player that leverages a laptop when you're trying to win a chess game. It's really no different than that. And so very quickly um, to make these things super simple for my students. Um, I try to break down these hard concepts like automated construction into their salient points, into the real basic DNA. So if you think of the things that we work with, uh, integrated teams, machine collaboration, machine collaboration is nothing more than people and computers coming together. Robotics is nothing more than computers and machines and so on. And so I think this is an important thing to do. Um, you know, while I describe computational designers, as having these four C's in common. Another one is, is that you all need to be teachers. You all need to share information. And one way to reach out to the other 80% who aren't uh, benefiting in the way that you have in your careers by being exposed to these tools is to show them essentially how simple, um, simple these things are in some ways um, because you can break them down into really simple things. In terms of design being predictive, we're able today, we have the complete capacity and ability to, instead of building a building and waiting a year and doing a post-occupancy evaluation, we now can just ask uh, questions or inquiries to our programs, to our algorithms, and get back answers instantaneously, informing the design before you ever design the building. So you can do a post-occupancy evaluation for the design before you've even designed the building. And we know this because there's a hundred other tools out there like this one that will edit photographs before you've even taken them. Um, we have the ability through algorithms to do this. This is just a reminder that um, for my generation, if you're working in data or intuition, those were either or propositions. The two never came together. And this went for the practical and ineffable. You took a stand on one side or other. You're going to be a technology person or you're going to be an ineffable designer waving your arms around trying to wow the client. And now these two are the two extremes 
are merging. Um, and that's an incredible opportunity. You just need to be comfortable with both. If you think you were brought up and born a left brain person, I'm here to tell you that's really going to be important moving forward in your careers to get comfortable with your right brain side um, because the two sides aren't going to be as distinguishable. The head and the heart um, design and fabrication, um, it's going to be very important to be comfortable with both. And this goes for something, and this is very uh, important for me in my career. Um, it's this idea that designers, uh, I was a design architect for 30 years, uh, designing high rises and housing um, and large scale mixed use projects. I'm very comfortable as a designer with ambiguity and with uncertainty, but it, you, you recognize pretty quickly that your clients aren't so much, the ones who are taking out millions of dollars in loans, in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars in loans. Um, they want clarity, they want certainty right away. And so we need to find ways to uh, provide that. Another thing that um, we're seeing more and more of is pro projects are becoming more and more complex, of course, and time intensive, but that's immaterial to a client. Clients want things simple um, and instantaneous. For many of you that work as a consultant within your firm, your client is the person that you're trying to remove the pain points from. That's your client. They want things to be instantaneous and simple. They don't want you to teach them for six months how to use a tool. They want their problem to go away. And so we know things um, at the end of projects, and we start not knowing. And if we redefine what we do is going from not knowing to knowing, and we recognize that design is this iterative process, and we know with our tools, our generative tools, our computational tools, that uh, within seconds we can go through these iterations, um, I think this is a really vital way to define what we do. Maybe abstract, but vital at the same time. And because we work with the cloud now, um, you know, there, there was a long time. I've been writing books only for six years, but five, six years ago, you couldn't say we had instant feedback. You'd say, at some point about three or four years ago, it was near instant. It's instant now. It's simultaneous. Um, you no longer have to hand your design off to an energy consultant who then three weeks later came back with the feedback on your design. Meanwhile, you've redesigned the project. Now um, we're able to do this um, because our models for computational tools will turn red when we've gone outside the constraints and will turn green when we're working within them in real time. And so um, this has all benefited us and it's created this ecosystem of these overlapping tools that we're all very getting more and more comfortable to work with but need to help others get comfortable with this uh, as well. And again, this idea of breaking them down to simple parts. Another thing we're going to do is to, uh, as we start to work with AI and machine learning or more and more work with it, if you're already working with it, is to be able to help others see what's not real AI. Um, there's a lot of stuff, we have a lot of apps on our phones that will tell us where parking spaces are, and that's not necessarily a really sophisticated use of the technology. And so we're going to look at fake, weak, and narrow versions of AI. We'll look at the tools we're currently using that are sometimes hyped by the marketing people as being AI or as being predictive. Predictive because you put a flight of stairs on one floor, and so it will tell you, oh, you must want this stair to continue down. You know, that's an AI tool. No, it's not. Um, but maybe it is. So you need to, this is something you need to be able to talk about, about the tools that you're using. Are they truly predictive? Um, is it based on data? Is it based on your past behavior? If you've designed a stair a certain way in the past, or work with a team that designs it a certain way in the past, um, is it important then that, that the tool is able to replicate the way that you design things? Um, and so on. So we're going to look at the tools that we currently have and we're going to ask ourselves, are these things really useful for us? Um, are they going to help us to automate? Um, the other thing with AI is we're not ready for this part of AI, which is, um, is w whether the robot knows that it's doing what it's doing. And I, right now I'm here to tell you that's not that important. Um, it's more important that we find ways to automate what we're doing. It's more important that we leverage machine learning so um, so the tools that we're using uh, can teach themselves to improve as they go along. Um, so AI breaks professions down into tasks. That's how it works. Um, one way of referring to that is de-skilling. That's my students' number one concern, uh, de-skilling, which is 
Um, basically, you, you, you graduate from school and you go into, you know, work in a firm and you just expect to be an apprentice to a master or to be an architectural intern and do these certain things. Um, and the fear that they have isn't that the robots will take over or that automation will put them out of a job because automation is just going to let them design more. What they are afraid of is they're not, they're going to miss out on that opportunity to leave school and start working in practice and learn the trade. That's something they were looking forward to. They're missing out on, this is another fear that they have in working in flow. In other words, it's one thing if you're designing and getting lost in your design, but if you're learning and uh, trying something new and hard, potentially you can be in a state of flow where time disappears and you just get lost in your work. And that's something they're afraid that if you take away the majority of their work and just give them design assignments or anything that leverages their core competency, um, that's their number one fear. But the AIA also breaks things down into tasks. So the way the AIA, um, American Institute of Architects, we're in the AIAS offices right now, now, talk about what architects do in terms of specific things. We do massing, we maximize daylight. Architects are really good at laying out sites and working on programming and so on. Um, and so um, I spoke at AIA uh, National in Washington, D.C. this January, and I challenged them. They've come out with statements on sustainability and other topics, and I challenged them to come up with a statement about AI for our profession because we need to address groups beyond um, beyond uh, this group right here um, and remind ourselves that architects are more than the sum of their parts. We're not cars. Uh, you can break what we do down into individual tasks, but that doesn't, you bring the, all those tasks together, that's not the architect. So the final third, the last 10 minutes of this talk is really looking at um, the career part of things and the recommendations that I promised you, the dozen or so recommendations. So I think super users are really made up today of three components, design, technology, and leadership. And leadership is the one that we don't think that often about. We don't think about what we do beyond what we're doing right now. A show of hands of those of you who are right here before me who have a pretty clear idea of your career path in the next five or ten years within, your, let's say you stay at the same organization. Do you know what your next title will be when you get a raise? And no cameras on you, so nobody will know it's raising their hand. Okay, you're, you're your own boss. Okay, that's not, okay, that doesn't count. Yeah, most of you don't, okay? Unless you're too shy to put your hands up. Only two out of the entire audience here um, for those uh, tuning in from home. Um, put their hands up. And that's my experience as well, talking to super users around the globe. They really don't have an idea. And part of that is because the leadership of their organization doesn't recognize what they do in terms of historically who got promoted. And while, you know, I might be a rare individual who can point out a few computational designers and design technologists who became design principals and very wealthy and very successful within their organizations, they're the exceptions. The vast majority have come up or grown in organizations as IT people and they've become CTOs, you know, chief technology officers or something along those lines. Um, so the SOM model was after you uh, leave school and you, um, you know, intern for a couple years, you take the exam and pass it, there comes that day you get the hand on your shoulder and says, you've got to pick a direction in your career. Are you a designer? Are you a, a project architect who's more um, technology focused? Or are you a manager managing, you know, clients, managing teams, managing budgets, managing schedules? Um, I am here to tell you, since I've taught professional practice for 17 years and um, seen the research on this, project manager has the greatest longevity career-wise. If you go the manager route, you, you know, think about the firm principles that you know, the vast majority of them have been managers. Project architects are second, and designers, um, as a you know, building designer myself my whole career, um, it's a fairly short career. There are very few building designers that have gone on um, to become um, design principals of firms. They may start their own firms, but um, generally speaking, um, somebody else graduates from school, learns the new tools, and can do what they do in half the time just as well in a lot of cases. So talking to Ryan Cameron, I know who's spoken, 
uh, SFDUG. Um, and he came up with a couple terms that might be the computational version of these three roles. And this, this is one of those magic things that happens when you have these conversations about super, with super users about um, careers. And so project designers become computational designers. Project architects perhaps become design technologists. Um, and project managers become design technology directors. Um, but it's more, it, it, the important thing is, is that it's not the title. Uh, the important thing is that you work for an organization that recognizes that you're delivering value. And, um, and to the extent that you can uh, represent yourself and show that computation is a critical part. It's not just, you're not just a consultant who solves a problem and then goes back to your corner until someone else needs you. It's not just an IT role. It's something that is uh, part of the heart and soul of your organization. Until that time comes, until we see leadership as being part of design and technology, um, this, th it's not going to happen beyond the handful of firms that currently recognize this. So that leads me to the 12 recommendations and the wrap up of this talk. And I see these recommendations as the fire truck that can keep that fire from burning your house down. The first recommendation is be concerned and be vigilant, be aware, but don't be fearful. There's no reason to be scared. Uh, historically, every new technology, including this one that came out of your neighborhood here, um, the iPhone, um, it, it did away with other technologies like the, can you know, in some cases the handheld camera and so on, um, the telephone. Um, but in other, many other cases, in most cases, it's always uh, created other jobs. Um, so I think of the lyrics to um, wake up from Arcade Fire. Um, I guess we'll just have to adjust or adapt or cope with AI and machine learning. And my first recommendation is really to say, no, if we're going to be leaders, you want to leverage what we're doing. You want to leverage AI and ML. You don't want to uh, be fearful of automation and robotics. You want to thrive, exploit, embrace, capitalize on these tools. And as an advocate, not hyping it in some marketing way, um, but as an advocate for these things, you want to find ways and always talk about it in positive terms, in ways that um, will help move the industry forward and also at the same time your careers forward. The second thing is, is yeah, design buildings, um, but also design processes and algorithms and many other things as well. And here's one reason alone, but you can look at the head, this is a headline from yesterday, 80,000 more retail stores could close by 2025. Um, that's not news to anyone that's ever shopped at Amazon um, or at Amazon, the brick and mortar version. Um, uh, so fo focusing your career on brick and mortar may not make a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Uh, so we, we just be a designer, play up the design side. And the other thing you can do career wise for that second re recommendation, and this is something I did a TEDx talk a few years back uh, on the seven year career. Every, you know, stick with your major. Your major is architecture, it's engineering, it's construction, but always have a minor. At five, every, you know, the, the best super users I ta I've talked to um, throughout my career are those that reinvent themselves. Doesn't mean, you know, quit your job. It doesn't mean leave the field. Uh, find a way to refocus, you know, stick with your main meal, have a slightly different dessert every couple of years. Um, your minor needs to change. And because growth, self-growth is part of what you do, uh, that should be relatively straightforward for you. Emphas emphas we we over uh, make too big of a deal of analysis, I think, as computational designers. So synthesis is something we need to emphasize. emphasize, emphasize. Um, you'll never out-analyze a computer. Um, computers are always going to win that game, and so one skill, one superpower you have as designers is this ability to synthesize and to bring things together. You can already do it. And I think, again, when you look at the yin-yang of the practical and the ineffable, for example, or design and fabrication, I think it's a mistake to focus on one or the other. Being able to uh, bring it all together is an uh, important superpower that you already have especially if you've gone through a design program in school. Number four, identify opportunities for automation. Don't just focus on what can't be automated. So 
while this may just be a given speaking to a computation group like yourselves, this is something that's uh, not thought too much about, I think, by the general, um, not the general public, but the 80 percent that aren't leveraging these tools and um, looking at them beyond maybe a tutorial or two. So um, again, this is part of the 80-20 rule, and this is your ability to focus on the few vital tasks that the very few of them that will uh, impact 80% of the results. This is really what you want to be able to do, and that is a superpower. It's an ability to not get lost in the weeds. And I think one of the weaknesses we have currently when we work in tools like Dynamo and Grasshopper is to get lost in the weeds. It's almost impossible not to, in a way. But you, one of the um, superpowers we have as designers is to be able to zoom in and zoom out. You guys can literally do it with your tools. When I was in school, we did it by in the studio by stepping on our uh, stools in the studio and looking down on our drawings, and that's how we got perspective. We're putting it up on a wall, obviously, and zooming in and zooming out. Um, it's this ability to see, hold on a second, all this time and energy I'm putting into this thing, is it in the end really going to have the bigger result? And so this becomes one of the uh, things that you look at. Architecture isn't what's left over after everything's been automated. Uh, Ian Keogh, the founder of Dynamo, said on Twitter, famously. Um, and um, so, I, again, don't focus on just what's left over. Redefine optimization. I think um, we have this love for uh, efficiency and for uh, zeroing in on um, infinite reduction. And I think there's other ways to optimize. We can optimize in terms of creating the best situation, create uh, greater spaces that more people can enjoy, that where they can enjoy, where they can engage with the architecture better. Um, be meaning makers. Meaning is something that's lost the minute that we start stop sketching in our moleskins and our tracing paper. We're no longer having these conversations with ourselves. This is a proven thing. Anyone who's worked in uh, simulation or optim optimization tools, um, we lose touch with the meaning of what we're doing and the meaning of our designs. Uh, so this is truly something that we need to get back. And anyone in the room who can find a way to create that dialogue, uh, leveraging the tools that you're leveraging and not lose that, uh, instant million dollars. Um, I mean, that's a million dollar idea right there. And it's something that, uh, you know, when you think about interoperability, when, when your boss sketches in a moleskin or on a piece of tracing paper and hands it to you, yeah, I spent a good part of my career inheriting their sketches only to realize they're radically different than the actual scale of the site or the section of the building and so on. You, you need to find a way to reinterpret it and so on. And it is an in interoperability thing and something that we need to uh, get better at. Another one along those same lines is to deliver insight. Don't just solve the problem. But because you have this ability to zoom in and zoom out and see the context of what you're working on, the problem, see the context of the problem, you can actually deliver insight. Um, and many computational designers define themselves as thought leaders, which is really interesting in a way. Um, and a thought leader is just somebody who is able to manufacture insight along with the solutions. Human override is really this idea that as we're working on these generative designs, yeah, the most optimal scheme may spit out a design that has all the windows and doors on one side of the building. You still have the opportunity to say, you know, from common sense, perhaps, um, that that's not such a good idea. Um, and so you're living in a time where at least for the next 10 or 15 years, we'll still have that opportunity. Number seven out of 12, focus on creating exceptional experiences and in, in moments within our projects. That's something that should not be outside the venue of being a computational designer. And this goes for also the way that you present what you do. Tell stories, tell narratives that capture the data and the information instead of just churning out spreadsheets and numbers, uh, droning on and on about numbers. Find ways to become better storytellers about what you do, whether it's even just on your own website, whether it's the way you present yourself when you meet somebody in a bar and tell them what you do. Become better uh, storytellers about what you do. Make architecture that matters. Um, we're spending a lot of time right now, architects and uh, critics, um, trying to convince everybody that what we do is really important. 
Um, sometimes we feel that clients don't appreciate us enough and are, are, again, the leaders in our organizations in terms of computational designers don't feel like we're appreciated enough. So that's something we need to do. Number nine out of 12, collaborate with technology. This is, usually gets a lot of eye rolls when you talk about collaborating with technology because it's what we do every single day anyway. Um, but again, going, uh, going back to uh, Kasparov and others who have uh, used laptops or computers along with chess, they're always better combining the two, not one or the other, but it's, a, it's not an either or proposition anymore. Augment, don't replace architects, number 10, number 11, help others transition to AI. Again, you're a teacher, you're a trainer, and one of the great things you can do is um, you may be comfortable with these things. There's many, many people that aren't. And the last one is think like machines. Um, and <laughs> just as importantly, um, I was actually at Berkeley a couple years ago giving a talk and the resource architect at AI National stood up during the talk because I had just said something along the lines that architects should think like structural engineers. And he said, no, architects, he just like interrupted, no, architects should think like architects and structural engineers like structural engineers. And we can never, he's a good friend of mine, but um, we can never come to an agreement on that. I still feel really strongly that um, we shouldn't try to force machines to think like us. That's a waste of time. We keep talking about getting machines to think like human beings. Why do that? Machines think radically different than us. It's just, it's better in some ways. It's just different. Um, but more importantly, figure out the way the machines are thinking. How are, they, uh, how are they cutting to the chase and coming to the solutions they're coming up with? And while we're at it, think like other people on the team. Really find ways, because when you think about, when you think like others on a collaborative, integrated team, you're able to change the words. You're going to say windows instead of fenestration if the person you're talking to is a plumber, um, and so on. So just to wrap up, ask not will architects be better off if the machine decides this. That's a question that architects, especially architects my age, ask all the time. But these two questions, will our clients or users of the building be better off if the machine decides it? Or even better, this is the best question, will people be better off if the machine decides this in collaboration with an architect or engineer, contractor, or all of the above? Will people be better off if the machine decides this in collaboration with an architect? So I'm ending, ending with a trigger warning, just like I opened with one. You're all you're going to go back to work in the morning. You're in a field with disruption. And you've got the attitude that that's not going to scare you away, which is huge. Get others comfortable with it as well. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Great question. Um, I'd say the best way that they put it is it's really important that they were actual hands-on users of computational tools at some point. They didn't just become opportunistic managers, to, again, to differentiate themselves where they felt uh, a lot of firm leaders will lead computation teams and rise up an organization without ever actually touching the tools. Um, if you've touched the tools and use them and comfortable with it, and always stay involved, keep your hands on them, but not 100% of the time. Um, you don't want to mic micromanage others. You don't want to take their laptops away and say, no, this is really how you do it. Um, but if you really understand how things are done, you'll know how to talk to everyone, and that will be recognized. So I think a lot of firm leaders have described the fact that they started where many of you are right now, and they, at some point, let go of doing it as a full-time gig. And they have gotten comfortable managing. It's interesting that you say we work because, yeah, some of the uh, computational um, experts or geniuses that have gone to WeWork may have said to themselves, I wasn't interested in working in a conventional, traditional firm doing that, where I'm going to be managing budgets and schedules and people and money and everything else. Um, 
And those that are willing to let go and do that extra thing, um, I don't see as selling out. I don't see it as the Peter principle when you rise in a hierarchy beyond your level of competence either. I just see it as the natural next step where um, you're able to think like everybody else. Um, and again, not because back in the day you messed with the tools, Everyone that I'm thinking of, without naming names, when the book comes out, you'll hear the names. Um, it's all of them take the subway home or on their Uber going home at the end of the day and start messing with tools, even though they might be in their 40s or 50s, and even though they may not, that may not be their day job. They still have that curiosity and interest and confidence to do that. So hopefully that answered. Yep. Um, Thank you. In particular, there was a chart that catched my attention, the one that was summing uh, design, data, and robotics to make automatic construction. Uh, I'm strongly agree with, with, with that chart, also because if architecture is something that you, that you cannot uh, tear down in simple pieces, construction may ease. And my, my question is, how far we are? What is currently broken? to get to the result. What's broken? Today, yeah. Oh, I mean, you have another 45 minutes, Susan? <laughs> um, collaboration is broken. The fact that um, we're still, to this day, working in silos. Um, not in this room, you guys are collaborative. Um, you're talking with each other. Um, but um, we tend to present ourselves as experts in our own little area. So that's part of it. Um, slow to change. I mean, that's just a cliche about our industry. That's broken. It's, this, um, it's very hard. Just like I said, the one thing I can't teach, and this is true of any professor, when we get together, one thing we all have in common is we can't get students motivated. You can't inspire somebody. It's just got to come from yourself. Like, if you really think somebody can motivate you, like, everybody stand up and, you know, dance and cheer, it doesn't work. Um, and there's nothing I can say to a student to make them curious um, and inquire about something. It's just got to come from themselves. I, if they see that I'm enthusiastic and really passionate about something, maybe it will spark something. But that's about as far as it will go. And why do I say that's broken? Because I think there's a lot of cynicism in our field. I think there's a lot of skepticism. Um, a lot of people in the AEC industry um, I don't want to be too disparaging about this, but it's like they found their little thing that they're going to work on and focus on without connecting all the dots. And that's that. broken. In terms of being conservative, our, our ANC is just third before banks and the boat, probably. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, and there are exceptions. There are definitely companies and uh, st uh, startups in the last couple of years that have um, started to connect the dots and uh, have vertical integration and uh, recognize that we can be part of the entire pipeline, not just a player within it. Um, so, and again, with the Gen Zs coming up, I see a lot of um, the issues that we have going away. If I have a concern, I don't want to turn this into a speech, it's a question, but I want to answer it thoroughly. Um, I am a professor after all. So, um, it's this idea that the one thing about the startups is, okay, you guys, your field, your industry is broken, so you just keep being broken over there. We'll be over here changing the world. That is how I see the startups right now. And that's great, and it, you know, it, it reminds me of maybe when cars you know, were invented originally, 100 and something years ago, and everyone's like, well, what about the horses? What are they gonna do? And, you know, and, um, that didn't really stop the car industry from moving forward, right? Um, and car is short for car horse-drawn carriage. That's, you know, it's related in a way. Um, it reminds me of that a little bit, that it could be we're so broken that we won't be able to fix things ourselves. And everyone in this room will eventually work for LinkedIn or Google, Katera, WeWork, and so on. That's a possibility. Yeah? Well, actually, the way things are going, Real, real loud. I did uh, yeah. work in the public sector. Okay. And, uh, so we have a lot of uh, contractor that is not built. And we have recurs, swingers, et cetera, who are leading the team and the architect is becoming another consultant. 
yeah. state without doing the design. So right. Everything is scheduled, budget driven. Right. And the clients, you know, it's going to be the Air Force part of the agency, love it because they're getting the project done in time or ahead of schedule and under budget. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's another. That's another. Um, are they um, getting a better result though? Well, they, design. I mean, uh, so it's risky. I mean, it's, I, it's really questionable because of what, you know, you well, can take an example, for instance, here in the city, right. full of architects and so on, and to my mind, a lot of the architecture that we're looking at is really crap. It's pretty driven right, by material suppliers, you know, all these panels, all these range screens that, that repeat themselves throughout. They look like computer design, but really, are they innovative? I mean, they're just pretty much the same old repetitive crap throughout. Uh, to me, it's sort of a shame we live in an incredibly productive and creative community, but nevertheless, the results are really shameless, in my opinion. Well, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because, <laughs> um, you know, at, at SFO, the, you know, we had, we had um, Skidmore designed the international program. Really beautiful, it's, you know, got a lot of bells and whistles. It was double the budget and took more time, and some of it had to do with 9-11 and things like that. And then they did the design build on Terminal 2, which is uh, American conversion. And the airport loved it because it got done on time, on their budget, and the iterative design process with, with the airport's inner agencies and Gensler, who was you know, working under Turner. You know, they, they came up with the idea of putting more uh, if this yeah. isn't a case study, it should yeah. turn into a case study. That right. yeah, that sounds great. To be airport yeah. more profitable, right. you know, it's done for much less money. Right. So they're totally happy and they say, okay, all other projects now are going to go design. Yep. End of score. Okay. Wow. You you but once one second. Um any any questions online? I just um, want to make sure we're not Yeah, there have been several. I was just waiting for a good question. Sure, so okay. you and then we'll go. Um, okay. so Ryan No 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 first first one here. And then yeah, go ahead. Right, right. So I think that I think that hap I think it already happens. A, a real quick example: Ryan Molinix, who headed up the um, Google design team, uh, Google headquarters design team for MBBJ, uh, did exactly what you're describing. Which instead of putting blinders on, saying we're just going to design you a headquarters, he said, um, "Yeah, like Steve Jobs. What if we put the bathrooms in such a way where you know we're going to try." three million different pre pre uh, permutations in terms of where the bathrooms go, and we'll see how many times there's serendipity in terms of people running into each other and having conversations. And they can run that uh, a script and see what the results are. And that is a value right there. So lever I, I still think it's leveraging the exact same tools. You're just asking different questions. And you're asking different questions because you're, you're going outside the box and saying, I'm not just a computational consultant within this organization, I, you know, I'm going to do everything you want to do. Gensler is a firm that literally, uh, I'm ch you know, changing my MBBJ to Gensler for a second. Gensler is a firm, I've always been blown away by, and I've collaborated with them before. Any client that goes to them and asks them for something, saying, we need to end our meeting at 4.30 because I'm, I need to go talk to this marketing company. They're the ones that you, Gensler will say, we do marketing. You know, yeah, they will do everything. They will just invent a new business overnight to serve a client. And I think that kind of mindset, in a way, um, as a computational designer, where you, at the very least you ask yourself, whatever needs to be done on this assignment, is it something that we can do, just leveraging these tools? And if not, can I invent, uh, add on a plugin that will do it? And I think all these tools will help us to make our life easier. Mm -hmm. When we're design, designing something, it's going to make our life easier. But we cannot really focus on only the tools itself. Right. That's right, right, right. No, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, now if that's a statement, <laughs> yeah, I agree, completely agree. Don't focus on the last slide, I think you said, like, think like a machine. I'm, I'm just, like, totally against that. I think, I mean, uh, 
I don't know. I mean, I think we need to think like a human. I don't know if these AI these tools are made by humans. So the more consciously we design the algorithm, that's probably going to be more human and better for everybody. Because at the end of the day, we're not really designing the buildings and infrastructures for machines. We're designing for humans. So the, no, the better you know about humans, the better you would be good at design. And in, on the other hand, like we can use this algorithm and stuff which, uh, to make that design process much more easier and faster mm -hmm. uh, to save time and be more efficient. Great. Yeah. <laughs> You said Ryan? Um, yeah, so Ryan Cameron says... Oh, oh hey Ryan. Um, um, he's looking forward to hanging in New York. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so it's kind of a, a multi-part um, question that he'd asked probably like 15 minutes ago. Um, basically, it's sort of... A, it is sort of a, so the first component is call it all read verbatim, call it first practice, are different in, uh, in the sense of learning. Uh, your reason for learning changes and from essentially from learning to get a job to learning to keep your job um, and he's currently running hackathons at DLR uh, to get people back into the sort of studio environment uh, to get them using tools making uh, mistakes acceptable mm -hmm. um, and sort of um, uh, maybe even trying to generate them so in a sense so um, so for he's asking that being said for those that have zero experience teaching, do you have advice to he and others um, that are trying to educate both co-workers um, in, in their physical sort of firms um, uh, in, in, practice, in the practice environment um, as well as outside of that because he thinks, it's, uh, he says it's, he believes it's key to uh, adoption of those tools. Yeah, absolutely, and I didn't mention that teaching is a big part of what you're going to do if you're not doing it already. Um, how do you become a really good public speaker? <laughs> yeah, you. Go ahead, and Anybody. How do you become a good public speaker? Just own that speech, whatever you wanted to say. You could do, you could do that. Um, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth a lot of times. Yeah, it's, it's um, uh, and I'm not there yet. It's, uh, it's really all about practice, practice, practice. It's deliberate practice where you go back, you watch your, you know, you wince and hear yourself or see yourself, and you keep improving. I think teaching is very, very similar. Uh, Cesar, you're teaching right now. What was the first time you taught? How far back? Uh, about yeah. Five years ago. Five, okay. And was there a time where you hadn't taught before? Yes. Okay, so how did you learn to teach? Yeah, just by doing it. So there's a great book I love. It comes from France, and it's by an author. It's called How to Teach What You Don't Know. And that actually defines, you know, hopefully none of my colleagues are watching this, just about everyone I know, teach, like, learns the subject about five minutes before they walk into the lecture hall or the seminar. Um, and, I mean, unless you're, you know, ancient and you've been teaching something for 30 years uh, from yellowed notes, chances are, you're just, it's sort of like you're making it up as you go. And um, so where I'm going with all this is there's tons of opportunities to, you know, just with all the universities around here, go to midterm and final reviews and sit. That's a form of teaching. Um, give desk crits. Ask a design instructor if they'll let you give desk crits. That's a form of teaching. Um, volunteer to be an uh, adjunct professor because... Lord knows it doesn't pay enough to do it for real, um, and so on. It, um, I think that's a, those are all really good ways within your organizations, even if you don't want to uh, dabble in the academic side of things, uh, try doing some tutorials. If you've got a website, try doing tutorials. Uh, that's a great way to start learning how to teach and um, you know, help others within your organization as well. Um, you know, the, the first moment you have direct reports, you have people that work under you, and as you start to rise in a company, uh, you do have to find ways to uh, teach them that's very effective and it's not long-winded and so on. Um, th that would be my suggestion. Yeah, go ahead. So. Uh, design for how people learn is a really great resource, um, especially for making tutorials, videos. Um, it's a lot about user experience and how we, how people understand things versus how you understand them. Yeah. Um, and how you can effectively communicate that. Great. And is there a link? Um, uh, 
it's a book you can probably get on book. Amazon via a link. Okay, great, great, great. It's a book. Great. Yeah, the book. That's a great suggestion. Okay. Another question? Um, there were some others, but they were uh, Okay. Uh, hey Sam Samuel, if you have a specific thing at this point that you wanna mention, let me know. Okay, we got one here. Uh, so I come from a very different background of mainly EC, CS with some uh, experience in machine learning. Mm -hmm. I'm looking into uh, generative design architecture and I have no idea about architecture. So I'm not going to design school or anything. So what are some good uh, resources or books to learn about data, machine learning plus architecture? Show you first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm not going to plug my books. Um, no, they're not. But they're not how-to books. No, go to architecture school. You're not going to like. Don't get architecture for dummies and think like that. No, that, um, no. But even my data-driven design book, it's literally just people talking about how how they leverage. It's very disappointing to a lot of people because you're done reading the book and you're, you know, it hasn't taught you how to put your hand on the mouse and do actually do the work. Um, so um, I don't know if there is a really easy way, but here's but here's. There's a startup called like Evolve Media. They are based in Colorado, so I'm actually using them like and like uh, helping out with the data driven architecture. Um, I also know the studio because I'm building a one-person company, so we can talk about that. Great. You saved me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> there, that, do that, yeah. and, and, and read that book. The design book. Yeah. Yes. Um, computational super users uh, see that this intersection in where they have the ability to impact organizations at the same time to develop tools. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at the beginning that a lot of architectural firms are actually technology. Uh, 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 Definitely. And um, but there's a lot of super users as well that are trying to monetize their external uh, intelligence and make a living out of that. Sure. But computational design has emerged from all, from this uh, uh, notion of uh, community-driven design, which is co comes to us almost as a free thing. At Grasshopper, yeah. from, right. it's coming to You get spoiled, right? Tool. Yeah. Dynamo also is, uh, to a certain extent... Uh, yeah, it just comes, it comes with Revit now, right? The, yeah. the major plugins available human UI and Ladybug comes free. Right. And so are we getting used to getting everything for free? What happens with those super users that are really trying to make a living on tools? Uh, do you see a problem there? No, no, I don't see a problem, but I, I um, this doesn't entirely answer the question, but I see the ones that are very successful. Jonathan Schumacher spinning off Construe at Thornton Tomasetti that's very successful. That's incredible. But the but again, it's it goes back to what I was saying about the startups in our industry. It's kind of like you guys keep practicing structural engineering. I'll be over here with this incredible startup with this tool and running that, and I really won't be in your company anymore. Um, I think in some ways, CEOs they're not placating employees, but we don't want to lose really good people, right? Everyone's going to jump ship and go to work at WeWork or LinkedIn or Google or Katera or wherever, it used to be Autodesk, I don't know where everyone's going now. Um, but there is a very big concern that we're losing good people in our industry. And so one way, one, what I'm getting at is, one way to keep them is when they do come up with tools to allow them to spin them off and form a company that is just uh, tangentially sort of tethered back to the company so you don't lose them completely, but they're really on their own. They're very entrepreneurial on their own um, at the same time. But what's happened is then we've lost that person really influencing the company. Um, in terms of, you know, I think the heart of your question is, I don't think we're spoiled that things are free and you have to pay for some things. Because I think you take a deep breath at some point and say, if you can afford it, or if you can just find a way to bill more. Um, I know when we ask the question to the client directly, do you want us using BIM on this project? I mean, the response 99% of the time is, I don't care what tool you use. It's just get it done, do it. I mean, that's I mean, maybe outside the clients you work with, because I'm not seeing a lot of uh, nodding of heads right now. Um, my experience has been that most clients aren't aware of the tools and that interested and not that involved and engaged. So they're not willing to pay for you 
to use these expensive tools. But if the firms can find ways to justify based on ROI, you know, the return on their investment, or based on um, getting more work because of what they do. Uh, Ryan Cameron, you know, who had the first question from the webinar uh, side of things, um, is a perfect example where he's brought into uh, client presentations and is able to win a project for the firm because of his magic. Um, and the minute you start doing that, the higher-ups in the company see it and value it, and then the culture changes because then you're promoting that, not just the person, but that activity um, within the company. And what I'm getting at is then when you go in um, to accounting or to whoever it is, uh, the CTO, and say, um, we need this new expensive tool or this piece of hardware or whatever it is, um, chances are you're going to get it much more likely if you have a couple of those success stories. Again, going back to one of the, the recommendations about learning how to tell good stories. Um, and, and Ryan is excellent at storytelling. Um, finding ways of not just saying, you know, watch the magic I could do here. You know, this, you know, he's actually very, on a meta level, aware of what he's doing in that situation and not manipulating clients or anything like that or ma manipulating the leaders in his organization, but he's aware that it's, he's telling a story. There's a narrative. He's not droning on and on with numbers, <laughs> putting people to sleep. Um, and that's what I'm getting at. Super users are able to do that, and then they're also able to get the financial support for the tools they want to use. So, yeah, we are getting used to getting things for free, but, but I think there's ways around that because there's a lot of really expensive tools that are excellent, too. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I would recommend that don't think of yourself as a competition user if you're trying to, you know, be entrepreneurial about how you go out and try and make money out of it. You try and focus on one, you know, vertical or one niche. You become the best competition designer for SAW or space planning or EVAC or whatever. And by doing that, you become known and then you can pick up more and more things. Too often you become general tool users and that doesn't become clear how we kind of affect the enterprise. Go and try and hang machine or try and go in and you know, find some. Well I think this is your call. I think we're out of time. Oh, yeah. uh, I think the internet is turning off in a few minutes. Yes, uh, I, there are no more um, I sent the final thing out. Uh, Ryan said, uh, says thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, See you in New York. Yeah. Uh, Sam, Sam uh, just was wondering, out of all of these sort of different areas within the sort of full design spectrum, if you will, uh, uh, so say, for example, I think uh, looking even at, at that image, mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite area to sort of, I think that's what he's asking. Okay. Um, <coughs> I guess my favorite area is not known. It's uh, um, because that's what drives me. Um, it's having the hunch and wanting to know something really badly. Um, the rest is just uh, this is the, the machine. This is the machine learning, or this is you know one time you know going through the machine uh, from beginning to end. But um, yeah, if I could pick one to take to a desert island, it wouldn't be data or optimization it would be not knowing um, because you just start with that question and digging and uh, it's hard to it's hard to explain this but when you think in terms of questions like that's uh, like I, I probably should, in another life should have been a journalist because I think all day long of questions and rewording them over and over again to get it somebody to open up and share the essence of what they do um, to make the best use of the time I have with them. People just give me 45 minutes usually. Um, and it's the not knowing, it's that curiosity that really drives me. Um, and the rest, I think, uh, just falls into place. So I'm sorry, Sam, I don't have a more. <laughs> Sam's speaking here, right? He's one of the speakers? Yeah? OK, that's great. So I'm going to call in and give him a tough question. <laughs> well, I, think that, uh, I think we're done, but I'll hang around and answer your question. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just had a last question on the you know that slide we had with the automated design and the the uh, I guess the uh, collaborative design. 
Yeah, crowdsourcing or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the old days, that used to be called either side from design by default. It means you're not doing anything to better anything. You just let it use a machine yeah. to design it, or you let your client. Yeah, or let the client. That's true. So it's it's passive in a way, right? Well, yeah, very passive. Very passive. Well, we as architects and we're engineers, we need to add values. You have one on one side, you have one on the other side. So in the middle, if we only give them two, they really don't have any reason. But we need to give them three or four. So we need to bring, you know, show them how you know, either we can enhance that process with the automatic design or and enhancing the kind of iterative collaborative design and steering it so that you have better summits yep. for, the, for the finished product. Absolutely. And better for the environment. Right. Build. Yeah, and that again is one of our superpowers, our ability to do that. That's the value we bring to that. Cesar, so, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the video is going to get uploaded over the weekend, and uh, there's more food to go. Feel free to grab uh, any pizza. Uh, uh, see you next month.